1. One day, as a bright junior in college, I had the brilliant idea of going on a date to a reptile expo. That was admittedly pretty fantastic. My girlfriend was a zoology major and was also excited about this thought. We got there and met up with a few friends and came across this lovely bearded dragon. He was for sale. This was the first of several mistakes that day. I decided to buy him. But Blood Knight, where will you keep him? In my dorm, of course. But Blood Knight, you don't have a terrarium. Shit, maybe this is a bad idea. At this point, this whole mess could have been averted. But with my dumb luck, one of my friends working at the expo declared he had a tank that I could just have. But Blood Knight, what does it eat? Oh, that's another problem, huh? So, what do adult bearded dragons eat? Small bugs, mostly greens and vegetables. They really like kale salads. They go nuts for crickets. Guess what they sell in wholesale quantities at reptile expos? Crickets. Crickets by the thousand. This was the second mistake, grossly overestimating how many crickets I needed. I bought two boxes. I made this wise decision without consulting my girlfriend. She did figure this out, and I ended up giving one of the boxes to the friend that gave me the terrarium. Thank God. So, with my happy lizard in tow, we named him Baron Nasher, and he's hanging out next to me while I write this. We headed back to campus to sneak a terrarium, a bearded dragon, a bag of sand for the terrarium, and a thousand crickets into my second floor dorm room. This was a great success. Nobody noticed anything. We popped open the box of crickets and gave a half dozen or so to Baron and closed the box back up. I just set myself up for my impending demise. Hindsight is twenty twenty, though. I headed out with my girlfriend to get some victory drinks at a nearby coffee shop. So let's take a step back real quick and talk about two things. The crickets came in a cardboard box. Did you know that crickets can eat cardboard? I sure as hell didn't. Did you know that retaping a cardboard box with the same used tape is a terrible idea? I should have known that one. I'm off getting coffee and I get a text from a friend and I notice a few missed calls. The text is to the point. Hey dude, so there are police in your room and crickets in the hall? Do you need help? Shit. Getting back to the dorm was surreal. Most of the doors near my room had towels or shirts blocking them. Mine had a whole pile to itself. I cannot explain how many crickets there were running around. I can say that we think roughly five to six hundred were loose out of the thousand. What made it worse was that there was a hole around the exposed hot water pipes that led to the floor below me and the floor above. The crickets hadn't actually succeeded in climbing up the water lines, but had made it into the floor below me. A friend on the floor below, but thankfully not under my room, described this as the girl that lives below you, and her friend started uncontrollably screaming. To them, it just randomly started raining crickets. Repercussions. You mean besides spending roughly six hours cleaning, catching, and disposing of crickets? That was entirely voluntary in my end, and I got a ton of help from my best friend and my girlfriend. Afterwards, I was officially written up for having a pet in my room, and the cricket incident is officially on my student record. That was hard to explain when poking at grad school. I thought my parents would be pissed. They actually found it quite amusing, as did many others. I got a discount when I bought crickets from a local pet shop when they found out it was me as part of my punishment, and I still don't really understand why this makes any sense, I was told to reach out to one of the editors of our school paper. He asked me about what happened, wrote an article, and I thought everything was done. I also baked cookies for my downstairs neighbour, and invited her to a game of cricket with some friends. She was not amused. Then a fucking news crew showed up. I chose the most boring week possible to do something stupid, in the news world, apparently. Because they actually had cameras and started interviewing people around my dorm. I hightailed it out of there and 
This showed up on local Boston news. They took it down after about a year. And no, I never had to do the bulletin board. One of my favourite bits to come out of the whole thing was a friend on the train in Boston heard a couple say, Some idiot infested his dorm room with crickets. How do you fuck that up? And she realised that idiot is me, resulting in, Hey, that's my idiot, what did he do this time? I think the worst part was the following month of crickets living in everyone's heaters. The chirping reverberated so well you could hear them in the hallways. All day, for a month. Everyone hated me. They were completely justified in hating me. Baron seemed quite amused with everything that happened, and he helped clean up some of the crickets himself. 2. It was my first semester of my first year at university. I was ambitious, overly so, and had signed up for Russian 101 in a moment of madness. It took me no time at all to understand that this was the first and last semester of Russian I'd ever submit myself to, and was just itching to get the final exam over and done with. By the end of the semester, my Russian skills were, like finances, dirt poor. I checked a provisional exam schedule. Russian was on Friday, great. So if Friday rolls around, I hadn't really studied, it wouldn't help. It'd be like trying to cram Swahili the night before. But I turned up at the exams hall, eager to get it over with and move on. There were a handful of subjects taking the exam in the same hall. I heard management students were supposed to sit over there, sustainable development here, mathematics this way, no Russian. Thinking I just missed it, I walked up to one of the organizers and bashfully asked them where the Russian students should sit. Russian? My heart sank. There's no Russian here. Great. The organizer guy told me to hold on while he checked his lists. Turned out the Russian exams were being held on the other side of town. About 20 minutes away at a slight jog. The exams were a couple of minutes from starting. But one of the organizers recognized my crappy situation and offered graciously to drive me there. I thanked them. I'd of course arrive late, but I told them quite honestly that missing five minutes out of a two-hour exam on Russian didn't really matter. I'd only need about five minutes to divulge my entire vocabulary anyways. So I arrived at the other hall, flustered, and came to a closed door. The exam had started. I didn't really want to burst into the quiet hall and proclaim my lateness, so for a few minutes I hovered outside. I don't know what my plan was, but I justified the ticking clock again with the fact that I didn't know any Russian anyways. After maybe five minutes, at this point I'm fifteen minutes late, the door opens and someone walks out of the room, I ducked in, and made my sneakiest way over to one of the organizers. Sorry I'm late, I whispered. I thought the exam was somewhere else. Where do I sit for the Russian exam? The organizer shook his head slightly at my idiocy, both of us unaware that my mistake was much bigger. Which Russian class are you taking? I fumbled for words. Beginner's Russian? 101? There was a moment of painful silence. That was three days ago. He said, fuck. But it gets much better. Come with me. The organizer took me upstairs to the office of the Dean of Russian. With my head hanging low and mea culpas all around, I explained to this woman that I had been totally under the impression the exam was today, and told her of my harrowing travels so far. For some reason, thankfully, she believed me and showed me mercy. She gave me a copy of the exam, told me to go into another room by myself, and complete it within two hours. I was so relieved. I sat down, realised I still didn't know any Russian, but wrote down a few key phrases here and there. After five minutes, I was done. I couldn't go back before time, so I daydreamed about life without Russian classes for the next hour and 55 minutes. When I went back to her office, she had a different look about her, more concerned. She explained that me taking the exam three days later was a pretty big problem, and that officially this wasn't valid. But she also had a solution. I was to go home, write an email about being sick on the day of the exam, and ask for a retake a month from now. She'd grant the request, but 
I would not take the retake, instead she'd just grade the exam I'd just completed. And that would count for the grade. I thanked her profusely, went home, wrote the email, and drank a lot of alcohol. It wasn't over yet. After a month and a half, everyone's getting their grades. Even the retake grades are out. But I'm still missing my Russian grade. So I write the most carefully worded email I've ever written. Not to give up the scheme the Dean of Russian and I had cooked up, asking if she'd had a chance to grade my exam. I received no reply. A day passed. Nothing. Two days. Nothing. I was beginning to freak out. Then, on the third day, I refreshed my grades. There it was. A C. A fucking C. In Russian. There is only one possible explanation. The dean must have lost my exam, and unable to ask me to do it again, considering her complicity in the breaking of a series of rules, she dreamed up a middling grade, which is way, way, way better than I should have gotten. Spasiba. Three. Okay, so this happened last summer. A little backstory. So I work for a lodge in a remote location of Alaska. There isn't much to do on my days off, so often I would take my 22 rifle and a six-pack out into the bush and go shooting. The shooting range in this area is about three miles from the nearest anything, and there's usually nobody out there, so it's just me and whatever critters happen to be around. On this particular day, it was really windy, and I had second thoughts about going when I was halfway out. I knew there were bears out there, and I always carried a bear spray. But the thing is, in high winds, the bear spray becomes relatively ineffective, because the wind blows it every which way, and can even blow it back into your own face, which is... not cool. Anyways, I get out there, and I'm doing my thing. The range is at the end of the road in a clearing with the radio tower nearby. I look down the road and see a local gal ride up on her four-wheeler, and we wave. She's looking for edible plants and such, and I carry on with my plinking after she leaves. After she leaves, I look down the road and see a black shape and think to myself, Huh, that's not a four-wheeler. It's a medium-sized black bear. I feel a pang of nervousness and think to myself, Keep it cool, man. I don't want to shoot anymore. Because it might rile the bear up. So I quietly pack my shit up and make to leave. The problem is the bear is sniffing around on the road and blocking my escape route. I wait for it to leave for about 15 minutes, but it shows no sign of being in a hurry. At this point, I start to panic a bit because... Bears usually avoid humans, and it could see me clearly and seemed aggressive. Here's the fuck up. I approached the bear. Anyone will tell you that this is a bad idea. But I was nervous about the bear's behavior. Also, a few days before, I had seen a black bear while out hiking, and I yelled at it, and it ran away. So I thought the same would hold true this time. I walked slowly down the road towards it, waving my arms and yelling, Hey, bear! The bear is totally unconcerned with my presence. At this point, I am perhaps 30 yards from the beast. Here's where shit gets interesting. Instead of running away, the bear starts approaching me, and then goes into a circling behavior which is bad, and a sign of impending attack. It passes to my right in a semicircle. And now my path down the road is clear, but... Now I have to face towards the bear, which could very well change. At this point, I'm in full fight-or-flight mode. I have the bear spray ready in its holster on my right hip, and a kabar knife ready on my left hip. The problem is that the wind is blowing strongly from the direction of the road, making the bear spray ineffective at all but point-blank range. At this point, I'm freaking out and yelling, Get the fuck out of here! and throwing rocks. This appears to work, and the bear goes up a nearby tree, and I start to back away down the road. I begin to break contact, backing away with my front to the bear. Then my greatest fear is confirmed, and the bear comes down out of the tree and straight towards me at a lope, 
Not a full gallop, but not walking. I prepare for the worst, shaking like a leaf with the bear spray in my right hand and the knife in my left. Right before it gets within bear spray range, about ten yards away, the bear turns and goes back up the tree. I start walking backwards fast as I dare. Thank God the bear doesn't follow me and I hightail it back to the lodge, where I promptly order a drink at the bar. A few locals there were bemused by my story, but also thought I was a fucking idiot for walking around the bush without a proper vehicle or firepower. Note, yes, I know I did a lot of things wrong, but I was scared and not thinking clearly. If you ever meet a bear in the wild, let it do its thing and do not approach it under any circumstances. 4. My dad entered a contest in 2006 for the Washington Post magazine, and his story won. Here's the story told by Dad. In June 2000, I had just started a new job and was invited to an outdoor party given annually by one of my co-workers. In our 40s and with two kids, my wife and I seldom went to parties anymore, or even to the movies, but the co-worker had handed me a flyer personally and we thought we should at least make a cameo. The party was just a few miles away, we left home at 9pm, telling our children, then 11 and 13, that we would be gone for 30 minutes. The first sign that this wasn't the tame barbecue we'd expected came with the rows of motorcycles parked on my co-worker's front lawn. Around back it was another reality, like stepping into Woodstock. The band was fantastic, pouring out Motown, Jimi Hendrix and everything in between. Tattooed bikers with braided beards and leather vests mingled with 50-year-old hippies and preppy suburban neighbours. Even when the music stopped, the people on the dance floor kept grooving. My wife, who was a big concert-goer in her youth, was instantly enamoured. We couldn't stop looking around. Next thing we knew, it was midnight. We immediately raced home. Oh no, busted. Outside our house was my in-law's car. The children had been worried and called their grandparents. We looked at each other and squared our shoulders, preparing to face our parents after breaking curfew. 5. I work in a nice office downtown. Unlike your traditional person who has bowel movements once a day like clockwork, I am one of those individuals who has a movement once every few days while I am at work. I cherish these moments because they provide serenity to my otherwise over-the-top hectic career. Taking the Browns to the Super Bowl is an opportunity to reflect on the greater questions in life, catch up on the news, and or browse Reddit. Today, whilst completing important work at my desk for the betterment of mankind, I received the urge to release the past few days' meals into their porcelain holding tank. That will take them to their next great adventure outside of my intestines. Despite being excited for the chance to refrain from being a workaholic, I slowly sauntered down the hall to the communal bathroom on my floor. The bathroom sensed my presence as I passed the threshold into its domain, and it automatically flickered the lights to life, as if beckoning me to move deeper within. I passed the urinals and the first two stalls, deciding to settle in the third, knowing there would be seat covers available. I took the paper seat cover from its cardboard holding box attached to the wall and carefully ripped out the centre portion, savouring the thought that I would soon be sitting on that cover and shredding some serious ass. I put the paper over the toilet seat and unbuckled my belt, unbuttoned and unzipped my pants and began to contort my body to nimbly rest upon the seat that, to my disgust, so many asses of my colleagues warm throughout the day. I am careful not to let my slacks move too far down my legs, lest I get overly long old dude floor pubes on my carefully tailored garment. I whip out my phone, recognizing the sweet success of deploying all safety measures to have a beautiful bowel movement experience. Tranquility befalls me. I begin to catch up on the news that has been streaming in for the past few days while I produced a glorious firm log that was larger and stronger than the Titanic, and was truly the unsinkable ship. As I read about the death of Kim Jong-nam, 
I rested my elbows upon my knees and allowed the calmness to wash over me. The peace did not last long. An unusual feeling, like cold air conditioning, had been directed exclusively to my marble bag, pulled me out of my Zen News consumption state. The sensation was peculiar, because icebergs don't tend to show up in corporate toilets. I shifted around a bit, making the paper seat cover crinkle beneath my thighs. I kept reading. There it was again. A cold feeling on my beanbag. I began to hypothesize that I may have gotten a dribble of the old yellow stuff on my rocks as a result of backsplash from draining the lizard. I shifted around again, hoping to subdue the odd air-conditioned feeling on my junk. Warmth washed over my coin purse. A sharp realization crossed my mind. Something was truly amiss. This was not the placid experience I desired. I clicked off my phone's screen. Kim Jong Nam's story faded away to allow my focus to be directed to more pressing matters. I looked between my thighs and into the ceramic bowl that held my magnificent toilet Twinkie. There it was, my floating turd log with my family jewels resting squarely on top of it. Dread engulfed me. My blood ran cold and goosebumps raised all over my thighs. What the fucking shit? I wanted to ask my creator why, why was it necessary to have my wedding tackle rest on top of my sphincter spear? I quickly moved my torso forward in my motion to stand up, which dipped my berries further into the bowl, causing them to push on the stink log like a talented lumberjack, performing a log roll, thereby rotating the log floating on the surface of the water. As my scrotum became free of the toilet and the rusty Titanic, the familiar cool air feeling passed over my sack again. I quickly grabbed toilet paper and gingerly wiped my nuggets, realizing that the sinks are in the public part of the restroom, and it would be too awkward if one of my colleagues walked in. While I had my seed bag hanging in the sink, whilst ferociously scrubbing it with hand soap. Resigned to the notion that I had officially fucked up and failed at life, I pulled up my pants, realizing I will still have to bleach my boxers and balls tonight. Hey everyone, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to 5 True Embarrassing Stories, Episode 30. Thank you very much to everyone who allowed me to use their stories in this video. It's been a little while since I've done one of these, although it wasn't too rusty. Uh, so you'll get this on Saturday. I'm hoping to have another video up for tomorrow, and uh, we'll see about Monday. I'm not 100% certain yet, but I'm trying to push myself just little by little to my back to my daily uploads. Uh, don't think I've got too far to go, so fingers and toes crossed. Hopefully next week we'll have a full week. Okay, and with that I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.